Okay. Can you, is this on? Can you guys hear me? All right. No, this is fine. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. It's hard to hear yourself. Can, you are can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. Good, good, good. So first thing you probably notice is that I... Thank you, guys. First thing you probably notice is I don't have a cowboy hat. I'm not Cody. Uh, unfortunately, Cody had a personal emergency, so he couldn't be here, and I'm doing the talk on his behalf. We had actually collaborated on this, uh, on this work. So, uh, of course, we can't start without a quote from a, someone nearby. Um, the context for what we've been doing here is that over the last few years, a number of us, a small group of us actually, who've been collaborating on Kubernetes networking and mesh networking and network security the last few years, we've been sort of watching the evolution of the stack, right? And over the last few years, the stack has actually gotten a lot more sophisticated. And in some ways, we've actually been working with literally dozens, maybe even hundreds of organizations as they've been adopting Kubernetes. In fact, I was talking to a few of you <laughs> this morning and asked them, okay, look, what's, what's working, what's not? And usually, connectivity, networking, traffic, you know, that comes up at the top of the list. I was actually surprised that it was the top of the list, literally with everyone I spoke to this morning. So, um, why is that a problem? Generally, there's, there's a reason for everything to be there. And it's the reason we are actually looking at this is because it pose, it's a barrier to entry for new folks looking to join the platform, looking to use the platform. It becomes a barrier to entry because they have so many abstractions to understand, so many abstractions to figure out, okay, what's not working? How does it work? Why does it work that way? Right? And for the organizations that go beyond that and start scaling their deployments, the complexity, but more also the resources start to grow exponentially. And we've been talking to organizations that have a handful of clusters, a few dozen clusters, and the amount of resource consumption <coughs> just for the connectivity exceeds the resources consumed by the application. And in some cases, these are like machine learning shops doing machine learning as a service or other sort of capabilities like that, where the applications themselves are pretty beefy, right? So that's quite, a, that's quite a statement. So to give you an example, just put yourself in the shoes of a service owner who's got to deploy one application, deployment version one, version 1.1 in an in a adjacent cluster. And so look, you go ahead and say, great, I define my manifest, and I go and deploy my application. Next step, of course, you've got to define your service so it can be accessed, deploy your service. And Give, give it some, uh, you know, your Q proxy obviously is going to go catch up and get your uh, kernel rules plumbed, IP tables, BPF, whatever. And most folks these days use ingress, so typically you have to have your ingress resource as well, or your ingress gateway, or your gateway resource. And the reality is most folks today, when they deploy it, you're exposing both your services and your ingress through a cloud load balancer. So wait for your cloud load balancer to catch up. And you know, sometimes it needs to be warmed up. This is all sort of normal. So far, everything is like progressing one after the other. The moment you get to any sort of microservice pattern, you typically need a mesh. Great, so let's go um, deploy a mesh data plane. Great, so that you've got your mesh patterns. But it's not just a data plane. You need a mesh control plane. So guess what? If you have a typical multi-cluster environment, you've got your mesh control plane as well. And it's not just the mesh control plane. Well, now you have multiple mesh control planes. That's the typical pattern people deploy with here. You decentralize your control plane. So they need to be federated. And the moment they need to be federated, you also have other elements like you have east-west gateways, you have to expose services, you might have additional proxies, waypoint proxies, east-west gateways. So it tends to add up. So, do you guys see the sort of barrier to entry for new people? And there's a lot of, I see a bunch of heads shaking in the back. There's quite a bit of stuff here, right? And to step back and think about this, the, the kind of feedback we've been getting from the organizations we've been working with 
is a typical application owner spends about 10% of their time on the initial deployment. And 90% of not just the time, but the resources, the troubleshooting time, the complexity, the cost, is in this other stack. And if you step back and think about this, what, what does the business care about? The business cares about the application and that it's accessible by clients. The rest of the stuff is plumbing, right? So and let me pause here, first of all, to say that as we've been going through this, we are not attacking any single one of these approaches. There is a very legitimate reason for every single one of them to exist. In fact, heck, we've actually contributed to a number of these. We've helped in the design of these. And quite frankly, for us, if we had to go back two years and say, let's do this all over again differently, we couldn't have done it any differently, I, I believe. We would have ended up in exactly the same spot. So what happened in two years? So we are all engineers, at least I imagine most of us are. And engineers, we always have a quest. Can we do things differently? Can we try something new? Can we make it better? Can we make it simpler? What, what happens if we do this? So something's changed. If you step back and you think about what all of these abstractions are fundamentally doing, they are stitching a path through the network. They are wiring different parts to the network. Oh, look, I have a new virtual service instance, and this is the path to get it. And I have a path through this gateway. So let's go stitch that path together. Let's wire that path together. And it's not that dissimilar from a traditional sort of old-fashioned telephone exchange with operators sort of saying, hey, I need to talk to Duffy 4031. And, you know, the connection slowly gets made across a bunch of... And fundamentally, if you step back and think about what we're doing with a number of these abstractions, in fact, almost all of these abstractions, we are stitching paths through the fabric. The way we do phone calls today is not that. <laughs> you pick up the phone, and you see, like, you don't see a number. You see uh, who's calling you, right? And you say, oh, damn, it's Andy. I'm going to pick up that phone every time, 10 times out of 10. Right? Because guess what? Andy gets priority. Every time I talk to him, I learn something new. Right? So you, you, you basically go, okay, I need to pick this up. If you get an unlisted number, you can decide, okay, I'm, not, I'm going to ignore it. Right? doesn't have priority. So the world, the world in the real world has sort of shifted to identity. You don't go wire parts to the network. You don't call up people by that number. Right? So, let me take us on a different angle. Because what I'm going to be presenting here, in our view, is very transformative. And hopefully, it starts provoking some thoughts in, hey, can we do things differently? And hopefully, the demo that we'll do will come and reinforce this. So, let's start by first asking this question. Today, you have to create all of these sort of parts for the network, wire them up, connect all these different gateways together. Let's step back and think about this. We've done this for a certain reason. But now, what if there was a new transport available to us that had more capabilities, that fundamentally was able to do this, or we were able to leverage it much more effectively? And more specifically, what if this transport had identity, workload identity, as a core part of the transport? In other words, how you route, how you send traffic from point A to point B, client to service, is now defined by the identity. And more specifically, in a context where you say, look, every client in my environment is going to have an identity. There's a workload, a machine identity assigned to the client. And so if, as a service owner, you can say things like, look, if I receive traffic from this identity, that identity belongs to this category, they have this certain 
level of service associated with them, maybe in a service level objective. They need to go here because right now, based on whatever metadata, whatever intelligence, whatever intent, that is the best application instance to deal with that client. And the fabric magically figures out how to get that client to that service, figuring out the optimal path, doesn't care about IPs, doesn't care if IPs are being natted, right? Doesn't care about like what happens in the middle. If that world existed, let's put yourself in the shoes of the application owner. And what if that new transport was now an internet standard? Not H3, but the technology behind H3, the transport protocol behind H3, specifically called QUIC. So QUIC was a standard as of two years ago. H3 is a standard as of a year ago. And there are some phenomenal new capabilities. But let's step back from that. The fundamental thing that we can enable here is separation of concerns. And the separation of concerns means that as a service owner, the only thing that a service owner cares about is I've deployed my application, I have this other version, I have this other version, they're running in different clusters, different clouds, doesn't really matter. There's some, as a service owner, what I define is what is the contract I'm presenting to clients, and that contract is based on the client's workload identity. Now, Yes, we are assuming that every client in this picture has a workload identity. Some of you may not have that state today, but ask yourself, if you're going to do true zero trust security, don't you want to know the identity of who's talking at the other end of the transaction? Not which gateway it came through, not what IP address was the load balancer's IP when it knighted the traffic through. You want to know who are, who's at the other end of that transaction end-to-end. -end. So you want client identity. And guess what? If you don't have a client identity, maybe you could say things like the service owner decides what you do with a connection. Do I do some default set of rules, right? So as a, as a service owner, you go, hey, if I get an unlisted number on my phone, I'm just going to ignore it or send it to voicemail. Same thing a service owner can say, I can just have a default set of load balancing rules, a default set of security rules, and so on. But if there is an identity, and the identity says this client or this consumer belongs to this group of identities, oh, that is mission critical. They need a service level objective. This other group of inbound connections, I don't care. I could deal with them as, as required. But the fundamental benefit here is separation of concerns. As a service owner, you focus only on the side. You do not care what runs anywhere else. You do not, in fact, in, when, when you see a demo, we actually don't need any of that stuff. We don't use any of that stuff. But that stuff can continue to exist because everything we're doing doesn't require any changes to the OS, to the platform, to the cloud, no changes whatsoever. We are working at a higher level and leveraging identities. So. One other question you might ask is, well, so this is great, but you know, look, it's going to take time to adopt a new technology stack for my application. Guess what? You don't need to modify your application at all, not a single change, because we're using this as a transport, as a wire protocol. It's, it's how the packets get sent on the wire. Your application could be sending existing H1 or H2 traffic as it always did. In fact, we'll show that in the demo. Right? So, literally, the big benefit here, and the reason this is transformative, is because we essentially saying this 10%, where, which is relevant to the business, that's the only thing that matters. And in this new world, this 90% of where people spend their time, no, don't worry about it. it it's, it's something that is, as an app owner, you have separation of concerns. Yes, there's still going to be cloud plumbing. There's still going to be other stuff. In, some case, in most cases, we actually don't need it. We actually can completely bypass it. But this is a fairly transformative shift in what we're proposing. I'll give you guys a second, because I'm seeing some sort of a uh, little bit of skeptical faces here. 
But I'm also seeing a few heads shaking going, this actually, this sounds interesting. Good. So let's start by a quick demo. And again, what I'm giving here is a little bit of a teaser, right? Actually, let me set up the demo first before I get to the demo itself. And um, it's a transport. We are not doing a tunnel. A tunnel implies you need access at both sides of the connection. We are doing a transport. And we're doing a transport that is an internet standard. When you watch this video later, that's the transport you're using because all the web browsers have switched this transport two years ago. This is literally, if you go look at the, this is 70% of internet traffic today is going over HCA and Quick. So this is the new standard. And for us, it's just a wire protocol. The application can still be H3 or H1 or H2. So just to illustrate, I picked one of the standard microservice demo apps. And what it is, is a bunch of, uh, like a bookstore kind of application. You have an ap application that talks to a book buyer microservice, which talks to a backend bookstore microservice, which talks to a book warehouse, uh, MySQL database to the backend, right? And the demo I'm going to show you is, actually, I'm going to show two, two demos, but the one to focus on is, okay, and by the way, there's also a book thief. Um, so it's illustrating another version of the microservice which may not be trusted. It doesn't have the right identity. So what we're going to show is first, how do we automate identity across this cluster? Oh. And by the way, I'll talk about the multi-cluster as well. But in effect, saying, look, now we've got identity built in, and we can do a progressive rollout from version 1 to version 2. And how do we do that where the service owner does not have to worry about have these rules propagated to the infrastructure, have these rules propagated to client side proxies, RPC fabrics, whatever. Right? So in effect, how do you do this progressive rollout? And the second thing that you'll notice here is now that the certificates, how do we ensure that book buyer is authorized, but book thief, which doesn't have the right identity, is not? So that's the demo we're going to show. And OK, so what I have here is just a running cluster. And there's a few things you'll notice here. Um, Hopefully, this is still working. Every so often, my two-factor kicks in. Yeah, it's still fine. And uh, what you have here is a, cluster, is a single cluster. It happens to be running on AWS. And you have a few things here. First, you have Cert Manager, specifically the Cert Manager CSI driver Spiffy plugin, which essentially what it takes care of is automatically provisioning an attested workload certificate for every workload in the cluster. I test it in the sense of you can establish the trust of the workload. Second, those certificates are short-lived, duration of one hour. Cert Manager CSI takes care of rotating those certificates and mounts it as a CSI volume. So every pod comes up with an identity automatically. Second is you have these services that I talked about, book buyer, bookstore, book thief, book warehouse, and so on. They happen to be running in this particular cluster. And just, just so you know, this is, I just deployed it a few minutes ago. You don't want to go with, with, you know, waste your seconds looking at kubectl applies, right? So this is basically what is applied here. So now let's go access the UI for the, books, for the book buyer as well as the book thief. And to do that, we we'll just do a kubectl port forward to access the two UIs for that. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, there we go. I've been running this for the last uh, few minutes, and there's a count of books. So if you go look at the book buyer user interface, it tells you, look, right now I'm purchasing all my books from version one of the bookstore because that's the only one that's deployed. And if you go look at the book thief UI, same thing. It's actually incrementing, and in this case, it's quote unquote stealing books. That's the demo application. So it, everything is going to v1 because there is no, no v2 at the moment. So Let's see what's in V2. So this is the manifest for V2. And uh, it's just a deployment manifest. There is no service manifest. And in the deployment manifest, you see this little thing that says, this um, V2 deployment belongs to the service, so I can associate it with the V1 deployment. They all belong to the same overall service. And the only other thing that is really required here, in fact, this is also optional, uh, in fact, Literally, that is the only thing that is required. And by the way, even that can be automated. So the intent is to go from 
50, 60, 70 steps to zero. And the other thing you notice here is the weight. Right now, I set a weight of 30. So if the other deployment had a weight of, let's say, 90, one third of the requests have to go to version two. That's the only thing that's required. The other thing I've just injected in here is to say, now start enable client cert, i.e. do mutual TLS. So previously I didn't have that enabled to true. Now I'm saying set it to true. And when I set that to true, there is another annotation called allowed identities. And the allowed identity says spiffy colon book buyer, book buyer. So service account book buyer in the book buyer namespace. In other words, I'm not authorizing book thief. So those are essentially saying when I go to v2 and the book buyer should work. So let's go deploy that. Okay, give it a second for it to start up. Um, so in effect, what we're saying is we've now deployed v2. Uh, when this takes effect, essentially a third of your traffic should go to v2. But um, in effect, book thief is, and book buyer, they're both being authorized with mutual TLS. So in effect, in this demo, we've done a progressive rollout and we've done mutual TLS. So uh, let's see if it started up here. Okay, there's v2, there's just an extra instance that I didn't know what happened there. Uh, okay, so give it, give it a few seconds here. Uh, the config update takes a few seconds. We could restart it, but it's, it's, it's fine. So in effect, what you should see is, in effect, when this deployment happens, there is some automation happening behind the scenes, which is completely taken care of by us. The fabric, the infrastructure fabric, is being orchestrated by not just not, not the endpoints, just the endpoint, just the server side. There's literally no control on the client. The client is simply just sending transactions. It has no idea that this is happening. And the server, the server application automatically takes care of the orchestration of traffic. So there we go. So essentially what you should see is now roughly a third of transactions are going to V2. If you change that weight to 50, 60, 80, depending on the performance, guess what? The traffic will grow. Also, now we enable mutual TLS. That annotation that you saw, that's designed to be completely behind the scenes. All of this can be automated any number of ways, which we haven't yet uh, exposed uh, in, in the product, but it's, it's, it's coming. So in effect, what we have said is, to come back to what this demo illustrates, and by the way, I told you about book bioworking. This is Book Thief's mutual TLS, basically saying Book Thief is not authorized. So you have mutual TLS in your application too. What I didn't show in the demo is all the observability that shows that mutual TLS is working. These are standard Grafana, Prometheus, the standard observability add-ons. But now linked to identity. In other words, it's not just app A talking to app B, but what is the identity of app A? Is it supposed to do that? So everything is enriched with identity, and identity becomes the core. So in effect, what you saw here is how a bunch of microservices, no change whatsoever. These are, applications are still sending H1 in this case, H1.1 in this case. We have essentially said that is being converted to H3 on the wire. And by the way, by doing that, suddenly your performance goes up by a third because we're working with a much more optimal transport, right? And nothing, nothing against TCP. I actually have TCP code in the kernel myself from 20 or 25 years ago, but there is a number of benefits to the new transport. So the key takeaways are, uh, the single most important point I want to reinforce here is uh, the world has changed and it is now possible to make life simpler for a service owner. And the service owner should not have to worry about that 90% of other complexity in there. Second, some of the key takeaways I wanna reinforce. One is what we're doing does not require any changes to the kernel, OS, 
platform, cloud, everything is happening as an application wrapper. So it's completely in the application. You could run this anywhere. You could run this on any architecture. You could run it in an edge worker. Doesn't really matter. Your client could be anything. Your client could be a web browser. Pick your favorite browser. It works. Your client could be any, literally anything. It doesn't really matter. Um, obviously, the security and traffic management, this is all. We're really focused on microservices. All of the common microservices patterns should be easy. If you think about the separation of concerns, essentially you're saying, look, as a service owner, do not worry about any of the other stuff. Focus on your application, and that's all that matters. We we'll talk about some of the cloud bills, but there is a significant amount of resources in the other infrastructure. Right? That's just one. There's a few more examples of that. And fundamentally, what you're doing is you're now tying your service level objectives, you're tying your business objectives, your policies to an identity. Hey, this group of identities, critical application. Make sure SLO is protected. The latency doesn't exceed a bound. This other group of applications, you don't care. right? And just to challenge all of us here, this isn't about attacking what you're doing today. There is a valid reason for all of that existing. But now there is a new opportunity. There's a way to rethink how we do this. Make it completely transparent to the application. So the application continues to run unchanged, but suddenly, we are saying all of this other stuff that we had to figure out, the 90% of time, resources, troubleshooting, complexity. Imagine if you had 40 different steps to go, or 15 different steps to go, and one of those doesn't sync correctly. How much time is wasted trying to troubleshoot? What is it? Is it a kernel natural? Is it an uh, intermediate proxy? Is it uh, something else, right? Is it a load balance that hasn't warmed up? All of that goes away. So this is a challenge to all of us. Uh, let's, let's collaborate. A um, little bit of a, so tomorrow I have a separate talk, but more focused on security, right? Uh, but this is, this is a opportunity, and my colleague Rick is here as well. We've been talking about this to a few people here already. Would love to collaborate more, would love to brainstorm more. I know some of you are focused on some interesting ways of leveraging Kubernetes into other platforms, other use cases. Those are all the kinds of use cases we are looking at. We are looking at the next 10 years. We are leveraging technology that will be the next 10 years of your life. This is the way the network is moving to. Come, come talk to us. Any, any, I'll take a couple of questions if that's time. Do we have time, Mother? Okay. So any questions? Yeah. Yeah, great question. The question is, uh, oh, sorry, I should have used the mic. Uh, uh, repeat the question. The uh, question is, when I'm talking about efficiency of transport, what am I referring to, right? Uh, latency or uh, others. So there's a ton of literature in the community over the last uh, many years about the benefits of this new transport protocol, Quick, versus the existing world, right? Including a number of folks who've been the sort of the folks who built TCP in the early days, going back you know, many, many years. Um, this is a more optimal transport. It has some characteristics. One is security is mandatory. TLS is no longer an option. It's built in. So to answer your question, we've actually found that despite this additional capability, because the protocol is so much more optimal and efficient, we are actually seeing an improvement in performance relative to the legacy uninterrupted traffic. Roughly, like for us, when, when we're doing benchmarks with a simple application, for example, we see roughly about a 30% improvement in latency. Now, there's a whole bunch of other kinds of scale testing that can be done. Right now, the big web scale providers are happily doing that because this is the protocol that they are using for exposing their websites to end users. H3 and Quick is what is running the majority of the internet today. So there is a lot of testing going on, but fundamentally, the benefit we're seeing is literally well, let's add security, let's add MTLS, let's add this. And yet we're seeing an improvement in performance. So does that answer your question? Yeah. 
Great. Any other questions? Second container in your pods, what's yes. that for? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, by the way, that's a good segue for the talk I'll be doing tomorrow, which is no sidecars at all. There, today, we have to get the traffic from H1 or H2 into H3 at the server side. That is a simple H HTTP to HTTP transaction. And uh, on the server side, we need to provide the intelligence for the application to figure out what the identity-based policies are. So for us, H3 and Quick is a wire transport, but on the server side, on the application side, we are providing it the intelligence. It's how we are building that intelligence into that layer. So uh, fundamentally what that is, is a, is a proxy to get the application into H3 on the wire. There's other ways you can do it. There's various ways to inject into that. We'll talk about one more tomorrow, which essentially eliminates the proxy. These days, there's a lot of other ways you can get traffic from an application to the wire without necessarily using a proxy. This, for this demo, I happen to show a proxy. Similarly, on the client side, you might have seen that there as well, but no state whatsoever, completely stateless. Other questions? When was the transport oh, Sorry. Good, Alex. Yeah, I've covered it. When, when was the transport first um, introduced, and yeah. what's the status of it now? Yeah, great. Um, quick as a tra transport was uh, brought to the internet community by Google many years ago, eight nine years ago. Uh, it was actually originally conceived at Google, and uh, it went through the IETF standardization process. And Quick was made a standard two years ago officially. Um, it's but many of the large web scale providers adopted it because it is the required transport for H3. So H3 is defined to work on quick, right? Uh, HTTP3 was a standard as of last year, but it's already been a wide, in widespread use. All the major browsers switched to using it maybe two years ago, three years ago as the default. So the original transport. Right. Other questions? So let me leave you with that takeaway, guys. Thank you for the time. Hopefully, this has been eye-opening. Again, the key point is there's new opportunities. There's ways to simplify the world. And think about this. If you are a service owner, you no longer have to worry about why is this platform so much more sophisticated than everything else. Your application could be on any platform. But you still get the kinds of capabilities that people have historically relied on Kubernetes for. Right? So it's, you get the capabilities but now in a much more simpler world. That said, thank you guys, and I'll, both Rick and I will be around, happy to answer questions, and hopefully collaborate. We'd love to get more folks collaborating with us. So, thank you. <laughs>